Grab the popcorn, take a seat, and welcome to Planet America. I'm John Barry. And I'm Chad Lichadala. This week, Florida is about to ban abortions after six weeks, but voters will have their say in November. And that could make the Sunshine State a swing state yet again. There's a lot happening on the campaign trail, so let's get right into it. Former President Donald Trump has walked away from supporting a federal abortion ban. Since the US Supreme Court overturned the constitutional right to an abortion enshrined in the 1973 Roe v. Wade case almost two years ago now, conservative states have moved to restrict access to terminations. Right to life groups and many Republicans also want a federal law setting a cutoff point while still allowing states to impose lower restrictions of their own. But President Trump says he's now going to stay out of it. My view is now that we have abortion where everybody wanted it from a legal standpoint, the states will determine by vote or legislation or perhaps both, and whatever they decide must be the law of the land, in this case, the law of the state. That is a definite switch. Throughout the primaries and even up until a couple of weeks ago, Trump was signalling his support for a 15-week federal ban. He was saying things like this. The number of weeks now, people are, are agreeing on 15, and I'm thinking in terms of that, and it'll come out to something that's very reasonable. But people are really, even hardliners are agreeing, seems to be 15 weeks, seems to be a number that people are agreeing at. But now Trump is not agreeing, although there is nothing actually in his statement that rules out signing a federal ban if he would be president and it would have passed Congress. Still, there was disappointment from Trump's conservative base. Anti-abortion group the Susan B. Anthony Pro-Life America saying that it was deeply disappointed in the former president's decision, but it did pledge its continued support for Trump, adding it will work tirelessly to defeat President Biden and extreme congressional Democrats. And that is despite the group saying last year it would oppose any presidential candidate who did not back a 15-week federal ban. Trump's golfing buddy, Senator Lindsey Graham, has been pushing for a federal ban for years, and he's not giving up, saying that he respectfully disagrees with President Trump's statement that abortion is a state's rights issue. And he says he will continue to advocate that there should be a national minimum standard limiting abortion at 15 weeks. And that clearly needled the former president who slapped back on Truth Social and in the process made his political calculations quite clear. Senator Lindsey Graham is doing a great disservice to the Republican Party and to our country. Many good Republicans lost elections because of this issue and people like Lindsey Graham that are unrelenting and are handing Democrats their dream of the House, Senate and perhaps even the presidency. Meanwhile, the Biden campaign has been running ads hammering Trump over the scrapping of Roe v. Wade, which only happened with the support of three conservative Trump-appointed justices. And Biden has been warning that Trump wants a federal ban too. Because for 54 years they were trying to get Roe v. Wade terminated, and I did it, and I'm proud to have done it. In 2016, Donald Trump ran to overturn Roe v. Wade. Now, in 2024, he's running to pass a national ban on a woman's right to choose. I'm running to make Roe v. Wade the law of the land again, so women have a federal guarantee to the right to choose. And, of course, that's the point of Trump's move. Biden's yeah. been running those ads for weeks. Those ads no longer work because Trump can say he doesn't support a national ban. And, to be honest, all those critics from the right before that you mentioned, they probably actually help Trump seem yes. more moderate even though he's very angry about them anyway. The polling favours Trump's position as well. According to Kaiser polling, in February, only 19% of people favoured the federal government passing laws to restrict abortions. 55% favoured the federal government protecting abortions and 25% said the federal government should do nothing which is the Trump position. CNN last August found that even amongst Republicans who favoured the Supreme Court overturning of Roe versus Wade, those people still favoured the Trump position of letting the states decide 66% to 34%. So this seems like a smart move from Trump. Only two weeks ago, a Democrat won a special election in deep red Alabama, flipping a Republican-held seat. Although, admittedly, the seat only had a seven-point Republican lean. But still, the Democrat won by pushing back against Alabama's strict anti-abortion laws. That's in deep 
red Alabama. So the Republicans seem to be in trouble. Well, has Trump pulled the great escape here then? Trump's hoping so. In his announcement, he even tried to put the Democrats on the back foot about abortion by painting them as the extremists. They support abortion up to and even beyond the ninth month. The concept of having an abortion in the later months and even execution after birth, and that's exactly what it is. The baby is born, the baby is executed after birth is unacceptable and almost everyone agrees with that. Now, what Trump's talking about there is the very rare circumstance of doctors discovering that the baby has a fatal condition soon before birth and then aborting the baby through partial dismemberment, which is grisly stuff. But to be clear, that is not someone deciding the day before she gives birth that she doesn't want to have a baby anymore. Trump, though, obviously is going to play up the ugliness of those examples all the way through the November. The problem for Trump, though, with this strategy is that none of that changes the fact that Trump is personally responsible for the end of Roe versus Wade. He can't avoid that. He's taken credit for it way too many times. So all the horror stories that are occurring right now in red states because of the end of Roe versus Wade, well, Trump owns all of them, which is why Democrats rolled out this new ad almost immediately. This is one of our willow boxes. This is just filled with some of the things that we had started gathering for her while I was pregnant. Yep. There's her little baby book. This is the outfit that she was gonna maybe wear home from the hospital. All of these. Um, this is... the blanket that she was in. And these are her little footprints. I'm Joe Biden, and I approve this message. Yeah, the silence really cuts through in that ad. It's yeah. It's very effective. And you can see a whole series of Donald Trump did this ads coming down the pike as well, John. It's mm. very clearly coming. It's a hard, if not impossible, issue for Trump to escape from. Yeah, absolutely. And the timing of Trump's abortion announcement was particularly significant. It came just a week after the Supreme Court in his home state of Florida issued two landmark rulings. Florida's Supreme Court has now paved the way for the state's six-week abortion ban to take effect. But in a separate ruling, the court ruled that voters will have their say on broader abortion rights and a referendum on the ballot in November. So, a ban on abortions after six weeks will come into effect in Florida next month, but an amendment to guarantee greater abortion rights, known as Amendment 4, will now be on the ballot in Florida on the same day as the presidential election in November. And if that isn't enough to drive turnout, there will also be another amendment legalising recreational marijuana. If approved in November, anyone 21 and up can get it. No medical card needed. And taken together, that could potentially turn what has been a pretty reliably pro-Trump state back into a swing state. Yeah, I think people forget that Trump only won Florida by 3.4 points back in 2020. There were 23 states that had margin shifts of at least 3.4 points in 2020. So it does sound doable, although it is a little hard to see such large shifts moving towards Biden in 2024 when he's on the nose like he is at the moment. Mm. Also, there is a long history in Florida of progressive ballot measures passing at the same time as Democrats lose all the key races in that particular election. So winning Florida might be a pipe dream for Democrats. Having said that, they have to be better off today in Florida than they were last week. Yeah, it certainly gives them a shot. Political scientist Aubrey Jewett from the University of Central Florida says that the abortion amendment will certainly have an impact, but maybe not as much as Democrats will need to win the state for what would be the first time since 2012. Well, I think having abortion rights on the ballot will certainly increase Democratic turnout higher than it would have been. Now, whether that means Biden can actually win Florida over Donald Trump, you know, that, that's, that's another question. But I definitely think Democratic turnout will be up 
and that they will be more competitive. And of course, some of that just depends on Biden and the national Democrats themselves. If they actually visit Florida, if they actually spend money like they have in the past, then we could very well be much more competitive. And, and there could be a surprise out there, you know, political surprise. But as of this minute, I would say it's going to make us competitive, but I wouldn't say that Biden's necessarily going to win. Anna Hochhammer from the Florida Women's Freedom Coalition has been one of the leaders of the campaign for Amendment 4. And while she's confident it will pass and it will restore abortion rights next year, she's concerned about the damaging impact of this six-week limit being imposed in May. It's going to have a tremendous impact in Florida. We have a population of 23 million. Four million women and girls of reproductive age live in the state. We have about 250,000 live births every single year. So denying women and girls in this state access to normal, modern health care is likely going to precipitate a tremendous public health crisis uh, within a week of the law coming into effect in mid-May. If it passes in November, it'll come into effect at the beginning of January, which means in the best case scenario, we're looking at eight to 10 months of the women and girls of this state being unable to access abortion care. I expect that we will see some truly tragic stories come out of the state in the meantime. Meanwhile, in the battleground state of Arizona, the state Supreme Court there this week ruled that a Civil War era abortion law banning terminations in all cases, except when it's necessary to save a person's life, is enforceable. And this law carries potential prison sentences of two to five years for abortion providers. Although the current Arizona Attorney General, Chris Mays, says no woman or doctor will be prosecuted under this draconian law in this state. But, Chaz, that does not mean that abortion services will be available in Arizona either. Absolutely. Or that the next Attorney General could potentially prosecute them. Although, having said that, the mm. Republican candidate for Senate, Carrie Lake, in Arizona is also turned against this ruling from the Supreme Court. So the politics of this issue are absolutely crystal clear. Yeah, certainly. It's less than seven months now until the presidential election day. And opinion polls continue to point to a very close contest between President Joe Biden and former President Donald Trump. Since late March, Biden has led Trump in five national polls, trailed in four and tied two. In the Real Clear Politics average of polls, Trump is just over one percentage point in front, but... That average includes the Rasmussen poll that has put Trump eight points ahead for the last two months. And uh, that poll does look to other poll aggregators like 538.com as a bit of a dodgy outlier at this point. Take it out of the averages altogether. And in fact, Biden is fractionally in front in the average of the last 10 national polls. Yeah, the national polls have really tightened up. Not so much, though, the key swing state polls. The Wall Street Journal polling, for instance, had Trump ahead by five in Arizona, ahead by three in Georgia, ahead by two in Michigan, ahead by eight in North Carolina, ahead by four in Nevada, and ahead by three in Pennsylvania. Biden was only ahead by three in Wisconsin. That was it. And as you can see, Adding in RFK on the right there didn't make a huge difference to those numbers either. Those state numbers, yes, they are closing up a bit, as well as the national numbers, but Trump does seem to have a slight advantage in the key swing states so far. And of course, they're what count the most. Essentially, what most polls are finding is that Trump is getting similar numbers to what he got four years ago when he lost. But... Biden has lost a good five to ten points across the board in every poll. So take this character polling, for example, from Gallup. Biden's lost 13 points on can he manage the government effectively since 2020. He's lost nine points on being likeable, lost nine points on displaying good judgment in the crisis, lost eight points on being a strong and decisive leader, lost seven points on caring for people like you and me, and he's lost six points on being honest and trustworthy. Whereas if we look at Trump's numbers on exactly the same questions, he's basically identical to what he was back in 2020. Nothing has changed, except he's also lost a little bit on honest and trustworthy. Not a huge surprise there. So the question, John, is going to be, have the people who have soured on Biden soured on him for good, or can he win them back?
That is the question. Yes. But we won't find out till about November the 6th, <laughs> our time. Former President Trump has been keeping a fairly light campaign schedule in recent weeks since sealing the Republican nomination, although last week he was in the crucial swing state of Wisconsin, which he won in 2016 but lost in 2020. Although, not that he's about to admit that. You know, we won this state. We won this state by a lot. And it came out that we won this state, actually. Actually, it didn't, because actually he didn't. He lost by 21,000 votes. Anyway, in last week's Wisconsin primary, while Trump did win easily with over 79% of the vote, that still left over 110,000 votes for his former rivals. And on the Democratic side, not only did Joe Biden win a higher percentage than Trump did on the Republican side, he also won 35,000 votes more than Trump did overall. But... Biden will have to be worried by that protest vote of over 50,000 votes listed as uninstructed. Uninstructed, similar to the uncommitted votes that we've seen elsewhere in the primaries, which are largely made up, it seems, of progressives opposed to Joe Biden's pro-Israel stance on the war in Gaza. Look, that might be a problem, although I think the times have changed a bit with views towards Israel in America. Back in November last year, only 36% of Democrats approved of Israel's military action at all. Yet independents were kind of 50-50 on it. So Biden was wedged in an awkward position, not knowing which way to go. But now, Democrats are almost entirely opposed to Israel's military action and independents are against it as well, with only 29% support. So what that means is that Biden is less the one being wedged by the issue. Now it's more Trump being wedged because the Republicans support it, independents don't. But we'll talk more about that on Friday. In the meantime, I want to talk about money. This is particularly relevant if Florida does come into play. Competing seriously in Florida costs hundreds of millions of dollars. So if one side does have a large financial advantage, this could help them a lot. As at the end of March, Trump and the Republican committee had raised $65 million for the month with $93 million cash on hand. Sounds like a lot. Until you realise that Biden and the Democrats raised $90 million for the month with $192 million cash on hand. That's more. Although part of that Democrat haul came from the biggest fundraiser ever. Barack Obama, Bill Clinton and Joe Biden all on stage together in New York. It raised a whopping $26 million. And the left-wing press crowed about how Team Trump knew it couldn't match these numbers. Well, hold that thought, because a week later, Trump raised $50.5 million in a single fundraiser, twice what Biden had just raised. It was a different kind of fundraiser, though. Rather than attracting thousands of people to a stage show, this was just for people who could afford $250,000 a ticket. And if you want to sit at Trump's table, that ticket cost you... $814,600. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not having to go at Trump here. Biden's got his share of rich donors as mm. well. Although I'm starting to think there is going to be obscene amounts of money raised this year, John, and they're both going to be able to afford to compete in Florida, I suspect. Yeah, they'll be spending big. <laughs> Now, before our program break, we spoke to Joe Cunningham, the former Democratic congressman who has now become the national director of the centrist group No Labels as it was searching for a moderate presidential alternative to Joe Biden and Donald Trump. And we heard concerns as well at the time from Democrats that this potential No Labels unity ticket could siphon more support away from Joe Biden and hand the election to Donald Trump. That's what their polling suggested would happen. Well, this week... No labels announced that it would not be fielding a candidate after all because it seems they could not find a candidate. Their strategist Ryan Clancy reportedly telling a Zoom call of supporters this week that at the end of the day, the hero needed did not emerge. And Joe Cunningham told Fox News that he'll now vote for Joe Biden over Donald Trump. The decision came following but not because of the death of the chairman of No Labels. That was former Senator and Year 2000 Democratic Vice Presidential nominee Joe Lieberman. He died due to complications after a fall at his home last month at the age of 82. Joe Lieberman lost the Democratic Party's Senate primary in Connecticut in 2006 over his support for the Iraq war, but he still won re-election to the Senate as a third-party independent. Two years later, he then crossed the aisle altogether, endorsed 
his friend, the late Republican John McCain, for president. Joe Lieberman was also John McCain's first choice for his vice president in 2008 until the Republican National Committee blocked that plan. So he had a long history of bipartisanship that kind of never worked out. Yeah, and even though no labels did become no candidate, the conditions are still ripe for third-party mischief in this election, John. People's faith in the two major parties is rock bottom. That graph there is people hating both parties. Since 1994, they've gone from 6% hating both parties to 27% hating both parties. In fact, one candidate's actually changed his name to literally anybody else. And he's now running for president as well. And if you don't believe me, there's his driver's licence right there. But of course, John, there is someone else. Turns out there are several someone else's. <laughs> Since our last show, independent presidential candidate Robert Kennedy Jr. has made an important announcement. His running mate. The daughter of immigrants who overcame every daunting obstacle and went on to achieve the highest levels of the American dream. So that is why I'm so proud to introduce to you the next Vice President of the United States, my fellow lawyer, a brilliant scientist, technologist, a fierce warrior mom, Nicole Shanahan. Nicole Shanahan is a 38-year-old patent lawyer and AI entrepreneur who was once married to the co-founder of Google, Sergey Brin. She's a self-described progressive who's donated money to plenty of Democrats over the years, including Joe Biden. In her first speech on the campaign trail, Shanahan talked about her upbringing, her father's addictions, her, her personal wealth and philanthropy, her activism. And then she turned to concerns that she shares with Kennedy about what she describes as the, quote, epidemic of chronic disease, which she believes includes her own fertility struggles and her daughter's autism, the causes of which she claims include things like forever chemicals, electromagnetic pollution, medications and vaccines. Pharmaceutical medicine has its place. But no single safety study can assess the cumulative impact of one prescription on top of another prescription and one shot on top of another shot on top of another shot throughout the course of childhood. We just don't do that study right now. And we ought to. And Shanahan also made this claim. Conditions like autism used to be 1 in 10,000. Now here in the state of California, it is 1 in 22. One in 22 children affected. The Washington Post's fact checkers say that those numbers are correct, but importantly, they lack crucial context as well. And that the percentage of people diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder has gone up mainly because of expanded definitions and better detection. They say that as there is no blood test for autism, a diagnosis is based on observations of a person's behaviour. And they note that concerns of a link between autism and vaccines were based on a notorious hoax. This is the Wakefield study, which was riddled with fake data and has since been retracted. And that dozens of studies followed, including one that studied 1.8 million children over 14 years, all of which showed there was no link. Fact checkers describe Shanahan's implication that there is a link as, quote, textbook anti-vaccine rhetoric, and they give her their worst rating of four Pinocchios. Now, it should be clear why Nicole Shanahan is there, though, and I don't want to always be about money, mm. but this is American politics, OK? It's often about money. This is no different. I'm sure it didn't escape RFK Jr's notice that Shanahan previously donated $4 million to his campaign to pay for one Super Bowl ad. And Candy needs a lot more of that money right now because he can't make an impact on this election if he isn't actually on the ballot in many states. But to qualify for the ballot in all 50 states, he needs to find himself about 900,000 signatures. Kenny's campaign is estimated getting those signatures is going to cost about $15 million. He only has $5 million in the bank and he needs that right now because the deadlines are hitting now. So getting someone on board who is young, female and connected and who also happens to be filthy rich and willing to spend that money on him 
That's a no-brainer for RFK's campaign. But as you say, John, she is very much a member of the left. A number of people have noticed, for example, that Shanahan is the chief joy officer for something called the Slumu Institute. Now, mm. that seems to be a kids' party place, but still, doesn't sound very conservative to me, <laughs> if you ask me. At least, at least it doesn't sound conservative to Trump either. He says that RFK Jr. is the most radical left candidate in the race by far, and that Nicole Shanahan is even more liberal than Candy, if that's possible. And finally, he says Candy is Joe Biden's political opponent, not Trump's. Now, of course, you can expect both candidates to be trying to define Candy as very similar to the other guy all year to get votes away from that guy. So Trump is trying to get a head start there. And it looks like he just did. Yeah, it certainly does. This year's US presidential election is now all but certain to be a rematch between President Biden and former President Trump. They are both the presumptive nominees of their respective political parties. But what if one or both of them is unable to stand in November's election due to death or illness? It's not an impossibility, obviously, given that Joe Biden's already 81 and Donald Trump is about to turn 78. Let's just imagine Joe Biden or Donald Trump are hit by a bus. What happens next? If President Biden is killed by the bus or incapacitated to the extent that he's unable to discharge the powers and duties of the presidency, under the 25th Amendment to the US Constitution, those powers shall devolve to the vice president. So, Kamala Harris becomes president. And if the bus accident happens before the Democratic Convention in Chicago in mid-August, delegates pledged to President Biden would be free to vote for another candidate. It's likely that would be now President Harris. Congratulations, you've levelled up. <laughs> but other candidates could be put forward and we could see an old-style brokered convention. Last time anything like that happened was in 1968, also in Chicago. And that triggered riots on the streets and fistfights on the convention floor. In 1980, Teddy Kennedy challenged President Jimmy Carter, but nobody actually got punched. If Biden were to fall into a void after the convention... The Democratic National Committee would meet, consult with party leaders, members of Congress and governors, then elect a nominee. Again, most likely then-President Kamala Harris. Congratulations, you've levelled up. That has never actually happened, but in 1972, Democratic Vice Presidential nominee Tom Eagleton dropped out of the election after the convention when it was reported he'd had electric shock therapy for depression. Presidential nominee George McGovern picked Sergeant Shriver as his new running mate and the party met again and endorsed him. Because Donald Trump is not the sitting president, the Constitution has nothing to say about what would happen if he were to fall into a void. If it's before the Republican convention in Milwaukee in mid-July, delegates would also be freed, candidates would be nominated, possibly one of Trump's former rivals like Nikki Haley or Ron DeSantis. If Trump has announced his vice presidential running mate by then, they could be nominated in his place. Congratulations, you've levelled up. They could even nominate a member of the Trump family. Good evening. I'm Donald Trump Jr. The last time Republicans had a contested convention was in 1976, when President Gerald Ford saw off a challenge from former California Governor Ronald Reagan. If Trump is taken out by a rogue elephant after the convention has made him the nominee, <coughs> Republican Party rules say they could reconvene their convention or just pick another <laughs> candidate. And if a UFO turns up after the election and Trump has won, but then gets abducted by aliens, then his vice presidential nominee would become president in January. Congratulations, you've levelled up. But that would all be a recipe for uncertainty, if not chaos. And after all, this is no game.
And that is all for another trip to Planet America. You will find us on ABC iView from 9pm on Wednesday nights and on ABC TV at 10. And we'll see you for a fireside chat on the ABC News on Friday night at 8 Eastern or anytime on ABC iView, YouTube and Facebook. See you there. Bye-bye.